All right. Um, so let me just start with, can you hear my voice? Those that are joining, and everybody in the room can. So yes. Everybody on online, can you hear my voice from this level? Yes. Thank you, Cliff. <laughs> <laughs> For those that don't know me, so I'm Sarah Godwin. I've been uh, here in the area for, I think, 10 years. I'm originally from Alabama. I don't have a Southern accent for those that are not hearing the Southern accent. Uh, I have a, a mother who is, uh, I'm going to say Yankee. She's from the New England area, you know, New York State. So I have pretty much a not Northern accent, not Southern accent, which I like. I think it works for me. Um, as Nancy said, I work on freelance as an editor. I've worked with several writers, different books, different stages, and I'm going to go through all the stages of publishing a book, from the working with a dissertation, editing a dissertation, specifically aiming it towards a book, even going into the actual printing, publishing, marketing, I'll go over all those different things. But I want to just start with why I'm very passionate about the written word. This is something I really enjoy. I love the spoken word. I believe in the power of words, that we have power in our voice, made in God's image, all those things that you guys know already. But what I love is the power of the written word. My background, my study is my, I have my master's in English, and I love the old, old writing. My, one of my favorite ones is Beowulf, written how many years ago? This is ages and ages ago. Way, you know, BC, and it's surviving in this time. And it's an amazing story that is just from history. Um, I think it was, oh, I actually think it's in the, uh, I'm not going to try and remember my, my master's or whatever that was written, but it's a story that still tugs at the heartstrings, it releases passion, and it was written by someone we don't even know their name. Anonymous is what people talk about, or unknown, when people talk about who wrote it but it holds power because our words have power. So what I love about the written word is, ooh, somebody else is here. <laughs> but what I love about the written word is it lasts long after we are gone. It's something that still has that power and authority. So when I'm talking about writing your dissertation, shifting it to a book and getting it published, I'm talking about something that can last longer than we do. And that's why I love the written word so much. So um, I want to start with, and I want to see if I can see more people. Okay. Um, how many of you are in the process of writing your dissertation right now? Either by a show of hands, all right, I can see some hands raised, all right. How many of you have finished your dissertation? Anybody get nervous when I say that phrase, finish my dissertation? No, it's never going to happen. Yes, it will. So, but um, I am going to talk mainly for those who are either close towards the end of your dissertation, but I don't want you to get lose focus. So if you're writing your dissertation, absorb this, work it into what you're working on, but finish your dissertation as is. So I'm going to talk about that process. The goal is that your dissertation has one specific purpose, but we're talking about after you put your heart and your soul into writing out and capturing that dissertation, what are the next steps? And I am going to, I want to, um, oh Nancy, I'm gonna ask you about this. How long is the, like, do you want me to try and hit like an hour and then ask questions or does that matter? Um, you know, probably as long as you want to go and I'm thinking. Um, well then we'll be here all night. Okay, <laughs> probably, let's see, we end at nine. Okay. And so um, if you want to, um, what, every time you feel like you need a break, for questions, go for it, and then, okay. then just keep talking as long as you feel like it's necessary. All right, are you not monitoring, or who's monitoring the chat box in case there's questions? I am. You are. Okay, so if you have questions, you can put them in the chat box. Feel free to raise your hand, either digitally or in the room, and I'll see if we can get those questions answered. But I am going to be going over a large amount of material, and because it changes drastically, um, I'm going to be covering some of it in depth and some of it just kind of hitting the surface across the top of it. So let me just first go over the four areas we're going to be covering. I'm going to talk about the writing process, specifically when you're talking about writing, changing a writing from dissertation to a book. I'm also going to talk about the editing process, which is the most painful, I think, process, or at least that's what's been communicated to me from people who are our writers. Um, and I want to also talk and touch on publishing and printing because that is just the physicality of a book. You want a book not to just sit in your mind or sit digitally somewhere, but you want to be able to actually get it out into the world, either physically or digitally. 
And then I'm going to touch briefly on marketing and promotions. Now, I've got experience in all of these pockets, some more than others, but I can, I can point you in the right direction and speak intelligently from experience on, on these topics. So I'm going to start with writing. It looks like most of you are in the writing process for your dissertation. So keep focused, and I'll just encourage you. It will, you'll, you'll finish. You'll, you'll keep working away at it, Karen. You'll get all of it done. <laughs> um, one step at a time, all of that encouragement. But what I'm talking about today is that concept of moving that dissertation to a book, because there is a different process and, and a different audience and everything. So dissertations versus books. Uh, so what is the difference between a dissertation and a book? I'm going to cover some, several of the differences, especially the larger concepts of what are the biggest differences. One of the main differences is an audience. So for your dissertation, who is your audience? Pretty much, is it Nancy? Um, <laughs> Is it that Actually, it? it's it's the world because we, we after have it everywhere after we um, we read it and we have to go over it and respond to it. Mm -hmm. Our our committee will, what happen, what happens is we publish it. Oh, and that's perfect. But you said the keyword I was looking for after it goes through, through committee. a committee. Yeah. So you are writing, so it will get into and through that committee, and eventually it will get published and released into the world. But your audience. Your very first audience and the one that you have to get to and reach is that committee. So consider this, when it comes to your dissertation, you have an academic audience, somebody who is either well-versed in it or is desiring to and needs to become well-versed so they can understand it and give you feedback. So my experience getting my master's, I remember coming in and having to go before my committee and it was four professors that I knew and had worked with for years. And I mean, but it's still a very formal presentation. I even now my heart rate goes up just a little bit thinking about it. <laughs> but I'm going in and and there was a a, a, a presentation I gave, uh, exchange between me and several of the professors. We had disagreements on what we believed about some of the things. But that was the whole point. Could I could it stand up to academic argument? That's very different from a book. The book, when you're moving from dissertation and shifting to a book, you have a public audience. And I'm going to go in more detail there, but consider those differences. Think about the authority. That's a huge difference when it comes to your dissertation or your book. In a dissertation, you need to prove your authority. You have to explain, I have done all this research. You have to present it. You have to have a very thorough and committed explanation for what you're doing and prove that you've done enough research, that you're not misquoting things, or that you haven't overlooked a major contributor to your topic. Uh, when it comes to a book, though, your authority by and large is assumed. You are the person who is the professional in what you're writing. And so when you're producing a book, you don't have to spend so much time going, believe me, I've done research. You don't have to have that continual effort and push and say, hey, I know what I'm doing. And then documentation, there's a huge difference in documentation in a dissertation versus a book. Your documentation in your dissertation, dissertation thesis is about establishing that authority. You've done it properly, you've followed the guidelines, and you really are wanting to make sure that your authority is represented, that you are not mishandling, misquoting, misspelling anything. It's very important, and it's all to have that lens that blends that credence of, I know what I'm talking about. About. Now, if you have documentation in a book, those things are recommended resources. If you actually, if you read a book that has like something quoted, usually it's like, hey, if you, in your free time, if you would like, go check this out. That's the feel and the tone of any documentation in a book. It's, uh, um, if you're writing something in scripture, you can say, oh, go check out this resource. So and so, you know, go read something from Bill Johnson. He is an expert on this authority. Go read something from Smith Wigglesworth. He's a, you know, but you're trying to help a reader get to other information, not to prove your authority, but because it would be helpful. So you're recommending something to them. It's got different reasons. And then length. Um, how long are your are your dissertations so far? I've worked with some really long ones. They're, they're from anywhere from um, twenty-five thousand to ninety-six thousand, I think, depending upon yeah, depending upon what degree. Okay, good. All right. So um, I'm going to turn that into pages for you. So most dissertations they're between one hundred to five hundred pages. So 
Um, the very long ones are the 500. Most of them are in like the 200, 300 range. Books must stay around 150 pages. Anything longer than that, and an audience starts losing focus. It's something that, uh, think about going to an airport, picking up a book. If a book is huge, most people will not pick it up. Most of them are almost the exact same length. Most of them, 150, 170, 180, that type of page range. Are you, are you talking, and, and may, I mean, I'm sure we're going to cover this, are you talking, um, they're, they're doing eight and a half by 11, 11 double space, mm -hmm. 12 point, you're talking different type and different size. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and I don't have the, off the top of my head, like the, the regular shape and size of the publication of the book, but when you're talking about just a regular book that you would put, pick up off the shelf, most of them, under, and, and check this out, go to, especially in bookstores, I'm not talking about academic, because again, those are going to almost always be longer. But most, especially the popular books, are going to be in that range. Six by nine, I think, Six is the most nine, popular maybe. size. Yeah. And three by five is catching on, but it, but it's not popular. Yes. So when it comes to length, we've got clarity for dissertation. And however long it takes to be clear, that's how long your dissertation is, making sure that you get all topics. For a book, the concept and uh, when it comes to length is does it have to be this long? Can it be more brief? Can it be more focused? And you've got to, and mainly because you've got a completely different audience. So think about this. What makes a good dissertation? I'm going to go ahead and just click through these. So for and you guys know this because you've already got these things. You've got a good thesis. It's clear. It's stated. It's early on in the book. You've got an academic tone. So that if there is specific jargon or language that's associated with it, you're using the Greek, you're using the Hebrew, you're using the language that is necessary to speak to your audience. You've got structure, organization, and um, and clear lines of thought so that you shift from one to another in um, almost a systematic process. Like and. For me, that was one thing I recall in structuring out my documentation for uh, for getting my degree. I remember just having walls of pages and saying, "What's going to go first? And what's going to go second? And moving whole arguments. No, this needs to go first because there's this whole process of how is it to be structured in order to prove my argument the best. You've got extensive research. We were talking about that before, Karen. Where you just research and research and read and read, and you have to document it if you use any of it, and it has to be documented properly. I'm sure Nancy's gone over all those or will go over all those. I'm not going into MLA, Chicago style, I'm not going into any of that. But all of those are the different things that you have to do when it comes to dissertation. Then you've got your supportive documentation. Do you have graphics? Do you have maps? Do you have resources? And you want to make sure that you have every single piece that you need in there. And again, it's to establish your authority. Like that's why it's in there. If you're referencing something in scripture and you reference a specific place, does the audience need, does the academic part need to have the map in there? Does it need to have the graphs of these different things? Um, what makes a good dissertation? Overview of the leading experts on the topic. When it comes to a dissertation, if I'm writing something about the healing movement in America, and I don't mention Smith Wigglesworth once, then I'm going to, all right, so I'm, I'm missing something very important. If I talk about evangelism in America in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, and I don't mention Billy Graham, I have missed something very important in my topic. If I'm talking about leading experts on the topic, I have to quote from them, reference them, agree with them, or disagree with them, but I have to have them in my work. I have to have a thorough exploration of the topic, especially if it's a controversial one. These are the people who agree. These are the people who disagree. This is where I fall in the, in the matrix of all of those different things. I, and then I have to have an original claim or perspective on the topic. Whether you're doing a case study and you've chosen several different things that are, that are unique with you, but you're having your approach. You're saying, this is my perspective. Now, it may have been something that's been written about before, but you're still bringing your unique style to it. You're bringing your perspective. But it has to be something that is not a carbon copy of what's gone before. And of course, a sound conclusion. Everybody has this in your dissertation, yes? Yes. And <laughs> Nancy says, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. Yes, <laughs> yes, do. <laughs> but what makes a good book? This one's interesting. I want to start with this. An intriguing title. When it comes to your dissertation, your title is usually either an academic title or something very informative. But for a book, does it have intrigue in it? Does it pull the reader in? 
Does it have an interesting opening sentence or paragraph? For your thesis, it has to be academic. I am studying this, or this is very important, and this is why I'm studying it. All, you've got all of these different things. Driving your point home, most thesis, most dissertations are almost aggressive in the language. I am bringing this information to you, and I am making this stance, and this is my argument. So it's got this very demanding and even an, an aggressive stance. Now, a book, you have to choose what is my opening sentence and paragraph? What is my creative and diverse content? Am I personally relating to the reader? And I'm going to go with this one. What is my tone? With a dissertation, it's academic. That's my tone. I can maybe be personable, but I have to be respected. I have to be sure that I'm proving my authority. So you don't have this familiar tone in dissertations. It's something that's if you make that choice, it's something that's has to be approved by committee. It's one of those one of those options. But when it comes to a book, you have infinite options when it comes to tone. I want to be creative. I want to be diverse. I want to have content that pulls from different things. And a lot of it will depend on what I am, what my audience is in the book. We'll get to that in a second. I want to have interesting organization. It's going to be clear, not clinical. And it may bounce around and cause confusion, but I'm, I am creating an effect in my writing. And so you want to actually pull emotions and talk about, how, do I want my reader to be confused right here so that I can then surprise them here? You have that option in writing a book where you do not have that option in a dissertation. In books, you will see a lot of use of sections, subheadings. You'll see that sometimes in a thesis or dissertation. But in books, you'll see that almost invariably, depending on, again, what it is. If you're writing fiction, even, they'll be broken down sometimes into sections and subheadings. And you'll see a lot of books go through and do closing thoughts and summaries of chapters, circle around back. It almost feels conversational, because that's what, what how books are, especially uh, the books that are written um, in the, the modern time, the last 10, 20 years, books have gotten much more conversational. So that's just an overview of the writing process. Any questions so far? Because I'm about to move to editing, which everybody's going to get to when it comes to the breaking down the, I see that hand. <laughs> yes. I, I wanted you to elaborate on tone, the difference between the dissertation and the book, because Definitely. I'm struggling with that. So in a dissertation, because you have that concept of establishing authority, you're not, I'm going to say not allowed. I'm going to use that word, those words, you're not allowed to throw in a joke. You're not allowed to have like a, this is what it meant to me, this is my personal experience. It really depends on what your committee says and what stance you're having, but you're, the highest priority for you is not losing authority. And so for you, that is the most important thing. Now in a book, um, the one that comes to mind, I was reading it recently, um, is Glad what Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers. He is very conversational in that. He tells personal stories. He talks about, um, uh, how he wished he was a hockey player, but he wasn't born in the right year, and he wasn't big enough, and gosh darn it, if it wasn't for this one experience, you know, and he'll just go off on what would seem like a bunny trail, but then he comes back. He's a brilliant writer, but he's able to go on intellectual, emotional, conversational bunny trails and bring us back mm -hmm. to this topic, and some of it's for pacing, but the idea is he's trying to have that feeling of, we just sat down next to him on a bus and he's telling us a story about when he was in hockey. And he's not trying to establish authority, he's trying to establish camaraderie. Mm -hmm. And so that I see is the kind of difference. So I'm talking about tone. I'm saying that he, um, for me, it's that concept of authority. If I'm writing my dissertations, my focus is, this is why what I'm saying is important, this is why it's established, and this is why it is, um, it's got all this supporting evidence. Whereas in writing the book, you're allowed to have more of that conversational and you don't have to have that I'm proving something feel to it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does that answer your question? Nancy, I'll um, see that hand. We, we have, um, this year's our first year that we've opened up the door to allow first person. Oh, that's wonderful, in your dissertations. Yes, because, okay, because that is just, that was in, um, I think Cambridge and Oxford, they were doing it before the um, United States the United States is starting to come in. Mm -hmm. But the, in that process, it is to establish authority. Mm -hmm. And it's to establish revelation. So there's a fine line, but they're still not, I believe, but they can make that according to their studies and revelation, if it's a supporting document. 
That's great because the um, first person is really it really does have a, a establishing authority instead of saying one thinks this right, right. after one does research on one topic. You know, like nobody talks like that. It's it's something that at one time that was the most authoritative way authoritative way to speak and to write. But in modern times, it is accepted. It's no longer no longer considered casual to say I found this in my research. So I I like that. Um, well, we'll get into um, it with with books. You'll see that um, there's so um, I, I took a, a writing course, and they said there was this interesting shift um, in talking in present progressive as opposed to past tense. And so, like one of the most um, popular books of uh, the 2000s was The Hunger Games, and it was written in present tense, present progressive. Um, Katniss wakes up and sees this, and she reaches out and does that. Everything's written as if it's happening right now, instead of she woke up and reached out. But that's that's a shift in modern writing that happened sometime around the 2000s, where it was permitted to talk in the present tense about a fictional story, not as if it was in the past tense. And it's something that's, for me, it was difficult to read for about the first half page to five pages. <laughs> But once I got in it, I was caught up in it. It changes the whole feel of the story. Um, so, Sarah, Sarah what, what that is is the active versus passive. Yeah. And so we we have a little bit of that. I don't go into great detail on that, but that's what they say is the better writing style, the active versus passive. Yeah, and when it comes to, especially with books, because you've got so much leeway, it depends on who your audience is. Um, let me go ahead, that's a good, I have just transitioned into editing. So when it comes to your dissertation, Knowing who your audience is is going to be one of the, the, the main aspects. And so, uh, no, when you're shifting the book. So I'll say this. Your dissertation, it's going to be hundreds of pages or thousands and thousands and thousands of words more than the book. So what does that mean? That means that something that you've labored over, something that you've written, something that you've loved and done a lot of work to find is going to wind up on the cutting room floor. Because that's what happens when you've got your dissertation. Your dissertation is the full-blown experience of doing the research, of doing the, all of the digging and finding and putting it down. But when you're moving from your dissertation to your book, there's this editing process where so many things hit the cutting room floor. So my, my first experience with this was in my master's where I had a, a, I had a wonderful academic paper and uh, it was 25, 30 pages, long, you know, at 8 by 12, you know, so it wasn't huge, but it was still, it was one of my favorite things that I've ever written. In. And I was going to a write uh, an, an English teacher's conference in Philadelphia, and they would only take the paper if it was seven pages long. So, yeah, I went from, tw I was either 25 or 30, and I had to get it down to seven. And it was so painful because... The, I had all these things, and I loved all of it, <laughs> and I wanted to keep all of it in there, but there's this whole process of, okay, no, you know, and so let's talk about that when it comes to editing. What do you cut? That's what I know. I feel like there should be, like, a support group, and I had to cut all those beautiful <laughs> Don't need a support group for that. <laughs> oh, so I need a support group for that. As for cutting off your, your content. Uh, yes. Exactly. Yeah. It's just, and it's, it's necessary and needed. But what's great about it is the dissertation, all the research and time that went into it isn't wasted because it becomes part of, it informs everything that you write. So that's what I keep telling myself. I'm like, well, somebody's going to ask me a question and I'll be able to talk about all this research I did that didn't wind up in my paper or my paper will be more intelligent. But extensive research that proves your authority can be, and I would say should be cut, because the book, your authority is assumed. You are the expert because this is your book. This is something that you are the speaker for, and so you don't have to prove your authority. So anytime that you're like, well, I read all of these different excerpts from this book, and I read the famous authority here, and I agree with so-and-so, who is an established person, all of that can be cut. That includes data, graphs, history of the topic, anything that you're like, but but this is the this is the most important part of the yes it is. It really is. And also it does not need to be in the book. So <laughs> I know that's why I feel bad talking, especially those that are writing their dissertation right now. You're like writing and going, this is all gonna be cut. 
No, no, no. Like I said, it all informs the overall topic. But these are the things when you're shifting that mindset from this is my academic audience to this is my public audience. It is the same thing as if you're talking to somebody who is well versed on the topic to somebody who has no idea what the topic is about. And you're like, well, then they need all that history. They need all of that work. They need everything that I've done. Well, are they, is it something that has to be there for them to get the main crux of what you're talking about? And that's going to be a difficult question. This is what I'm going to say and <coughs> other people to read it. Because they, especially somebody who will be kind enough to say, nope, you don't need it. Um, yeah, that's hard. You can, and this is something else that needs to be cut is the academic tone. Any jargon or elevated language, any time that you quote Greek or Hebrew where it is not absolutely necessary should be cut. So um, that's one of those things that it proves your authority when you have a grasp and a well-gifted handle for the, I, I know the Greek, I know the Hebrew. And that's amazing. It will help you in life and in talking about your dissertation. But when it comes to your book, that's when you have to sit down and ask that question. Is this absolutely necessary? Not it was good, not it was nice. Is it absolutely necessary? Is it central? If it's not central, if it's cursory, it gets cut. But I'm not saying cut everything. You get to keep some things. <laughs> but the things you want to keep is that authoritative voice. Remember, you are the author. This is your book. This is your presentation, whatever that you're doing. So one uh, I, I would say mistake possibly that, that, that authors or writers make if they're shifting from an academic tone and going into a public audience writing a book, sometimes they'll become wishy-washy. Well, it seemed to me or possibly because they've lost that authority of all that research. And so it'll start, there'll, there'll be that feeling of I'm not able to write this and be authoritative. And so what you don't want to lose is that authoritative voice, even when you lose all of the research that went behind it. You want to keep your helpful references and your interesting additional material. I'm going to, I should have put that in italics, interesting additional material. For those that, I don't know if you can see that, I'm going to say interesting. I want to be able to highlight that one. So interesting for me is the definition is if I were to tell somebody that at a party, would they go, Oh, that's cool. Or would they just be like, uh, I don't like, why, why are we still talking about this? Like they, is it something that the common person would find interesting? A person who doesn't know anything about the topic, would they find it interesting? And this is why it's going to help to get outside voices. So where to start? Now this again, this is about the book. We're shifting from dissertation to book. Choose your audience. For your dissertation, your audience is your committee. They're the ones who are going to be reading it, arguing with you, and, and hopefully seeing your perspective. When you've got a book, choose your audience. You get to pick who is your audience. It's not a committee. For Consider who are you writing for? What demographic needs this information the most? Now, when I'm talking about demographic, you've got several different ranges you can shoot for. What age group are you, are you shooting for? What gender is that important in what you're writing? What about socioeconomic status? Is this something that's really going to uh, resonate more with business people? Or is it going to resonate more with homemakers? Or is it going to resonate more with world travelers? Or people who stay at home? Like we've got all these different options. And for those that are writing, I'm assuming everybody here, spiritual content. What about spiritual maturity? Am I reading, writing for new believers? Because what you don't want to have is concept that is really high and elevated, but you're audience is new believers or your audience is new uh, is uh, really really educated people spiritually mature but you're writing really kind of like a, well let me define what the trinity is level you don't want to be having this concept that you're talking down to your audience so knowing who your audience is is i would say the first step mm -hmm. in that process and this goes back to to your question karen choose your tone is am i wanting to write to Christian, I'm, not, I'm writing to pastors who are starting their first church and I want to be their friend. I want to come alongside them and talk to them about how this is the process that we'll go through in this discovery. I'm talking to people who, or my audience is people who've never prophesied before and I want to be like their cheerleader or I want to be like their coach and, tell, and come alongside them and encourage them. Or am I wanting to, um, I don't know, you've got all these different options. Those are the ones off the top of my head, but choose your tone. 
choose your audience, choose your relationship to your audience. Mm -hmm. And this will help you a lot. Read books or skim through books that are aimed at your target audience, especially ones that have been published recently. So this is going to Christian bookstores or just bookstores in general. It doesn't have to be a Christian bookstore. If your audience is, we'll say stay at home mothers, you're like, all right, I wanna really reach out to them, explain to them what their place is in the kingdom or what their role is in the world or whatever it is. What are people writing to, the, what's, what's their tone? How long are the books? What's their style? What are they putting in and see what kind of ideas you can get. But this shows you what the audience that you're reaching for, what are they actually picking up off the shelf? What is actually helping them? So this will be really helpful. So um, in, in looking at the style, especially styles over time, that's why I'm saying get books that are recently published. And you can of course throw all this out, go with your own tone, your own style. It's your book. You get to choose what you want to do. But this is if you're wanting to have that strategic approach and say, what is it that is working right now? What is it that's resonating with people right now? And I want to resonate on that same frequency. So you do some exploration. It's very much, it's, for me, it's very similar to that process of doing that research for your dissertation. But now you're not trying to establish authority. Now you're trying to see where's my audience and what are they doing? And because, uh, and that, like Nancy said, my background is in editing, so I'm just going to go back to the cutting room floor again. It's, it's because it is. It's for, uh, and, and when it comes to authors, it's the most difficult thing because the whole dissertation is the baby. And you're just like, I don't want to have like little pieces. I want to have the whole thing at all. <laughs> Where are you? George is doing what? What is he doing? I'm thorough. You're thorough. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. You don't even want to ask. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so I was just, I'll say this again, uh, uh, just because for when, when it comes to working with writers, um, and, and because I do work in editing so much, it's difficult because my background is teaching. And so students would come to me with their wonderful papers, and they're just short, you know, three page or four page papers. And I have just gotten so used to saying, oh no, that's not, that. you don't need that whole paragraph. Just striking the whole thing out and seeing your little faces. <laughs> <gasps> exactly, but well, I love that paragraph. Yeah, but it wasn't good, you know, and it just, or it wasn't needed, you know, and just that. So that's I've carried that attitude with me. So I apologize if it sounds bad, but be brutal. No sacred cows. And so this is why it helps so much to have a reader or a good friend, somebody that will look at you and say, "It's beautiful, but you don't need," it, you know, or something along those lines. But um. And when I say no sacred cows, that concept of looking at, and I'll say put down your book, come back to it later, read, read it and ask that question at every single chapter. Is this necessary or do I just love it? And it's important to know that we do. We fall in love with our words. <laughs> Sorry, Karen. We worked hard. We worked so hard. Like I said, I identified. Like the... I, I remember um, cutting up that paper that I wrote, and again, the vast majority of it, the vast majority of it on the cutting room floor, I'm sitting there with my friends who all did the exact same thing. We're sitting there, and we're just like, I don't know what we just did, and I just, we all kind of all like hugged each other, you know, we're just like, it's okay, now we can go to Philadelphia and present these papers, you know, but, and it was still, what was funny to me was it was still good. I got down to the really, the heart of it. But it was missing so much. There were so many things that weren't there, and they would have loved it better. I'm positive. But <laughs> again, no sacred cows because you really and and what's wonderful is that it is a refining process. You do find out what is the heart of your message. Evaluate each chapter with your audience in mind, keeping in mind that most chapters. And I'm going to go with the. Um, George, what did you say the standard slot book size was? Six by nine. Six by nine. So standard six by nine pages, um, roughly uh, a 400 to 500 words per, you know, on a printed eight by 11 page. Um, you want to keep them, keep it to 10 pages or so a chapter. You know, where it's really, it's, it's like I said, it will be, it will be difficult. So I apologize in advance. Eliminate anything that is not required for your central point. And so what that means is you'll get into your dissertation and realize that there's whole chapters that are just going to be gone. 
And don't think about that while you're writing your dissertation, by the way. I know it's like it's so disjointed. But, but what you're looking for is what is it that my audience has to have? What is the heart of this? And not just the periphery. For me, it's like if I've got a story that I'm trying to tell somebody, and I know that we're sitting down to dinner and I've got hours to tell that story, this is the story I want to tell. It'll be my longest story. But if I'm in the elevator and they're like, hey, tell me that story, I am going to cut that down to the what's classic, you know, the elevator pitch or the elevator story. And you really do get to the heart of what it is without the flourishes, without the fuzz, without it. But and all that stuff is fun when there's space and time. But with the book, you're in the elevator and you really are trying to capture the audience back. <laughs> <laughs> Can I see you throwing things? There's a fight breaking out in the room. Every dancing children. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Oh, but again, everybody chose. Evaluate each quotation and resource. For me, the hardest part was removing whole, whole resources where I had pulled out, especially for me, uh, because I, uh, a, a dissertation will rely so heavily on who is the most famous or most respected person. I have to quote them. I have to get them in there. I have to make sure that that person is represented. For me, that was almost the first person that should be gone out of your book because you can't rely on their authority to prove what you're doing. They can be a good resource. You know, please re you know, reference so-and-so. They taught me a great deal. But this is my thoughts, you know, and you don't have to quote them. You don't have to pull from them. Um, mainly so that you don't rely on them for your authority. Is it interesting beyond an academic sense? Ask that question. Is it helpful to your target audience? Keeping in mind that your target audience, although they're going to be interested in this, they don't need to be inundated with research. Again, be brutal. Mm -hmm. The editing process really is I believe the hardest. It depends on per different personality styles. For some people, they don't want to be marketed, and we'll talk about marketing in just a second. They just don't ever want to do that. But I think for most people, that the editing process is the worst. I sat down with one student who they thought that their paper was perfect, and when I started just kind of making notes in it and crossing out words here, they were they were a little bit stunned, and they're like, "I really just thought that you would take it and go. This is the best paper I've read in my life." and just walk away and that's just and when it comes to shifting from the dissertation to the book just putting on that that hat of i'm going to be brutal i am going to this is something that i do not love and i'm going to cut it up you have to have that mindset not as a writing edit love it during the writing process but then shift that mindset for the editing process so questions to consider as you're moving from dissertation to book is the dissertation covering multiple topics? Now, this will help you when it comes, especially if you've got something large and you're like, well, I'm not sure how to cut it up or how to get to this, how to get to the heart of it. If it is covering multiple topics, consider turning individual chapters into articles. It's the same process. Choose an audience, choose tone, decide who it is you're writing for, rewrite it based on them. But maybe that whole chapter just turns into an article. You've got we've got Christian, Christian magazines and journals that are all across the country. And what is it that they're writing about? What is Charisma doing these days? What are they writing about? What is Elijah List doing? What's their process? You've got all of these different places you could publish in. And chapters could be articles, and that may be one way to jumpstart it. What about creating mini books on each subject? The, 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 the tiny little pocket books, those are, 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 are fabulously famous when it comes to uh, Christian bookstores. Um, people love being able to pick up a mini book and run and be like, hey, I'm catching a plane. I'm going to go over here. They'll pick up something very small. So think about that in your dissertation. Is there one point that I could pull out? It doesn't need the whole rest of the dissertation around it. This is the main thing. Maybe that's a mini book for you. And this is an interesting one. Do you have multiple audiences or the possibility of multiple audiences? Now, this is just one to explore. But what if you were writing to a different audience? How would your dissertation be different if you were writing a book, changing it to a book, and writing to high school students, or if you're writing to career adults? Are you writing to a person who is still in the process of maturing, either spiritually, emotionally, or mentally? Maybe they're children and you want to write it at that level. Maybe they're adults and you want to write it at this level. 
it might be multiple things that you are working on. And as you're working on your book, you're kind of pulling out, well, what if I wrote, and think about it. It helps even just to jog that mind and get it going into different areas. What if I were to write this as a children's book? Is it even possible? Do I have a heart for that? What if I'm writing this for business individuals? What if I'm writing this for people who are retiring? How am I going to change this differently? So think, especially when you're in the editing process, name, figuring out who your audience is and then playing around with different audiences will help you understand who, what resonates the most with you. And and see, uh, and, and uh, because we're, we've got the Christian, uh, Christian audience, I can say, talk about it with the Lord. You'll be surprised about what the Lord will put in your head and say, have you thought about writing to these people, this people group, this country, this way of life? And, and just see what the Lord does and develops. I'm about to go into the topic of publishing and printing, but are there any questions on the editing process? Yeah, there's one here. And go ahead. James wants to know what do you look for in an editor and what should an editor get as far as royalties? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, most editors don't get royalties. They're um, ones that you hire for the individual work. Uh, and they, it will honestly vary. Um, you can find them many different places. Um, the first part of this question was, what do we look for? In what do you look for in an editor? What you look for in an editor is a good relationship. Um, it really depends on how you work. Some people need an editor that will sit down next to them. If that's what you want, find an editor, editor in your hometown or in the city that you're living in that will work in, in, and go step by step and line by line with you. It depends on your personality. Some editors, they live in Alaska. You email them, they edit, you, they email back. And I, the, the editing jobs I've done, I'll ask a person, what is it that you want? Some people, they want to see every single comma that was removed. Yeah. And you want to work with an editor that will work with you. So if an editor says, I've got one specific style to edit, and it's not something that resonates with you, go to a different one. So there's not one answer to that, I guess. But Sarah, I don't know if you've worked this way. Um, an hourly editor, like he's asking about the hourly, I've seen where they'll charge by the word or by do you want grammar or do you want overall content, grammar, and word. You know, and I don't know. I mean, he says there's different levels. Okay. So you've got the copy editor who will just look for surface errors, where the commas are, where the spelling is. You've got other editors that will look more for, um, and I forget the name, the, the, the name of it, but it's a thorough, you know, something a, a, a more in-depth editor, and they'll give you feedback on the um, organization style. Some will actually do research for you, but that definitely costs more. When, um, when it comes to editing that, I, I don't edit on that level because it's it's a person who's coming alongside and, and saying, I will also check every single reference that you do. You can find those though. Like if, if you want somebody to check and make sure that you use the NIV every time instead of sometimes the NF NIV, sometimes mm -hmm. the ESV, you want to have somebody to go through at that level. So I don't know if I'm answering the question. Yeah, so I think he's looking for what is an, a good, a, a regular hourly rate he should look for. And then I'm sure you could, um, I don't know if you have time for your services too, that you can share what you, you know. I, I can do that, yeah. But he's, he's looking for what is a right hourly rate? Uh, an hourly rate, it's going to vary. The, the industry standards right now are right in the 30, 35, yeah. up to 50. Um, it really depends on, I would say 35 to 50 is about, is about average or about right. Um, but you want to ask them how many pages do they typically edit or how many words do they typically edit an hour so you can get a range. And, um, and then ask them what they'll do and not do. Like ask them if they're going to, they what they will not do is they will not do a layout for you. A page layout is different than the editor. So you're going to want to make sure you get somebody who is, who is going to be editing the content and then you're going to need to either find a different person who's doing the layout and doing the book cover and all those different things. But the editor specifically, you'll want one that will will work with you and have that kind of back and forth relationship. Sure. Um, yes, and, and for you know us amateurs starting out, I think it's okay. Rick Joyner would say in his writing classes, you need to have 20 sets of eyes oh, yeah. to review a book. So editing is one one description. Proofing is another description. Oh, but you can pass around to your friends yeah. and say, hey, would you mind reading this document? Mark up any uh, blatant errors you see in punctuation, grammar, or spelling. Of course, you can do spell checkers online today, mm -hmm. or a word, or whatever, after use. But you can start at a, at a homegrown level, 
of what's available to you of, of friends and then get that together. So you can do a lot of the pre-editing with your friends and family mm -hmm. before you go to pay somebody to do it. That's so true. that way you're getting the help of uh, people that have, might have the same heart and mind as you do, the same spirit, to give their input to it. Is it clear? Could you understand it? What do I need to cut out? Uh, just mark it up, chop it up, and give it back. And that can help uh, save you time and money. And then Peggy asks, do you recommend Grammarly? Oh, Grammarly. Um, Grammarly, it's, a, um, it's kind of a hit or miss because is that the one that you plug in the, in the, um, the work and it pops it back out or is that a, a hiring person? No, no, gra Grammarly, Grammarly actually, is the ending. Software. It, it, does, it does actually go through and tells you what, um, what your errors are. Yeah, so I'm going to go with what George is talking about. No matter what source you use, Grammarly is okay. I had students that, and, and I'm going to go back to my student days, they would plug something in. Um, if you've got a robot that's doing it, it will help. Like everything helps, everything you know. Helps. But I had a book I was working on. Uh, I was the editor, but then we took it through an editing process, but then sent it out to readers as well, which were friends of the author. And the readers still found little typos oh, sure. because, and, and, and it's one of those things that even after it was read by a professional editor, it was read by three proofreaders who had backgrounds in English and were working on it. We still had people who wrote in and said, by the way, there's a missing comma here, or there's a typo there. So as many times as a book is edited, there's going to be stuff that shifts here and there. It's, it reminds me of Picasso, who's all like, my work is not done. I'm still working on it. There's still errors. So it's when it comes to the work of an editor, the best thing that they can give you is the, this makes sense, or this does not make sense, mm -hmm. or your tone shifted here or it's missing something here. Uh, an editor that can give you that type of broad organizational structure, structural help, is one that you wanna, wanna look for. If all they're doing is helping you with commas and punctuation and whether things are spelled right, that's more like, sort of say, on the proofing side, the copy editing side, um, and that may be all you're looking for, but I'm, I'm looking for, if I'm looking for an editor, one that will tell me, hey, this didn't make sense. Or I had a question in my mind here, and you want to make sure that you answer it. So you want to have one that will push back. And those are, it's difficult because you're basically hiring somebody to fight with you. And, <laughs> but it's needed. They're, they're that person going back to the, um, this, this whole concept of the, of the editing when it comes to the, again, be brutal part. That's <laughs> what the editor, that's what you see writers and editors fight if they're talking to about each other. Because, there was, there had to have been fights because the author's like, but that's my baby. That's my thing that I love. <laughs> and the editor's like, but it's not needed. You know, and so there has to be a little bit, you have to have a person who you are willing to have that type of relationship with. Um, Sarah, <clears throat> two things real quick. Um, so one of my friends finished a book after 25 years of writing it. And even after 25 years and all the editors and she was reading it every day, mm -hmm. every day. And yeah. had people reading it every day. After it was printed, they still found mistakes. And so then maybe at the end, if you have services that you wanted to offer, um, be free to share that. Okay. And, and I don't know if you're, what your time is, because I know you're busy. No, I can, I, I, I'll do that. Thank okay. you. Any other questions on editing before I get to publishing and printing? Oh, and he, Cliff says Amazon KDP is free. Mm -hmm. What is Ooh, that? Yeah, we're, I'm going to talk about that. That's a good one. Um, the uh, Kindle Direct Publishing, we'll get to that one. Thank you, Cliff. Cliff, if you've used that before, I'm gonna, um, uh, we'll see if you can speak a little bit to that because I, I used it when it was Create Space and they recently changed. Yeah. Right. Oh, create yeah. Space. Um, so let's talk. So I, I'm, I'm going to cover some of the concepts of publishing and printing. So the publishing world changes almost daily. Um, so, some of, so instead of going into the details, I'm going to try and give you the principles, the overarching ideas. I'm going to give you, it's going to be generalizations, but I'm going to try to be helpful just to let you know the pieces of it, the basic principles. Everything changes over time, and so I want to make sure you've got those pieces, though. And, and a few resources that I'm pretty sure are going to be, um, that are going to have some longevity to them. Uh, so I'll give you all those different pieces. Some of you, you're going to want to hire a person and not think about it again. They're going to do the whole process for you and that's fine if that's what you want to do. I worked with somebody who did that. They were like, I just hired somebody. They did the layout and the book code, you know, they did everything. And then I worked with another person and they're like, I want to know every single detail. 
And so I want to know how to do step one, step two, step three, step four, and all of those. So I'm going to give you all the pieces. But I also don't want this to be overwhelming to you. You don't have to be the professional in all of this. But these are different things you want to make a list and say all of these boxes have to be checked, if not by me, by somebody. And I'm going to start off by just talking about the difference between professional publishing and self-publishing. So when it comes to a professional publisher, what they bring alongside you is marketing. It's included. They will market your book for you. They're the ones who will already have an audience. They already have their name or their foot in doors of the bookstores. And they already have platforms for you to speak on, for them to speak on. They have people that they are going to do email blasts out to thousands of people. So that's kind of the, when we're looking for publishing. We're, oh, I want to get a professional, I want to go with a professional publisher. They'll help, um, they, are going, they are going to look for you to be a traveler and a promoter. They're not going to do everything, so they're going to put some onus on you. Are you willing and able to have travel and publishing? The issue is they are looking for proven authors and speakers. Because it's a business, they aren't going to just take everything that comes into them and then publish it. Famously, all right, so everybody, are you familiar with, I say Stephen King? Don't judge me, I'm using that name. Okay. Um, uh, I went through one of the writing courses, and the book was recommended to me. It's a wonderful book. It's called On Writing by Stephen King. If you read it, I apologize. It has swearing in it. But um, he's a, not a Christian writer. But he talked about how he sent his book, Carrie, to so many different publishing houses before it was accepted. And he personally saved every rejection letter. So being rejected by a publisher is, I would say, being to be expected. <laughs> Because they, again, are looking for a proven author or speaker. And so if you're throwing it into the ring, I would say, for me, just be prepared. It'll probably get thrown back multiple times. So does it mean that the book itself is not useful or is not helpful? Or is it even isn't going to be popular eventually? Like I said, Stephen King's one of the, if you put his name on anything, people will buy it. But when he started off, it was not that way. When it comes to a publishing a professional publisher, one of the things you want to be careful of is actually read reviews of that publishing house. Because there are some publishing houses that will take literally anything, but they are not respected. It actually will hurt you as, a, as an author to get published by that, by that publishing house. Um, and so you want to just, if you're, as you're like throwing your book out there, I'm going to send it to this publishing house and this publishing house. Go and read reviews about them. It's just like going to a restaurant. You don't want to go to a restaurant who's got a bunch of one-star reviews and be like, no, this is a bad idea because I'm not going to have a great experience there. Publishing houses are the same. Some of them are respected and some are not respected. And so especially if you're just throwing out a first book or second book, whatever it is that you're doing, you want to not have the black mark of, I, I, I threw my book into the publishing house that had a one-star rating and publishes everything and is not known for being respected. So keep that in mind when you're looking at publishing houses. And there's a whole process that goes with that, and I'm not going to go into details with those, So, but because it, it will vary from publishing house to publishing house. But I will say, when if you are applying to publishing houses, you want to follow their application process to the letter because they will look at your application, they will look at what you sent, and if it doesn't fit the format that they sent to you, they already know that you're not working with them. And so they won't even read page one. So you want to make sure it's in the format that they've requested. And that's all I'll say about the publishing one. Self-publishing, I know more I know more about just because most of the people I've worked with have self-published. This is something that is new still. It's something that in the last 20 years has revolutionized I think if Stephen King had started today, he would have self-published instead of going through that process. That's my theory. Why? Just, um, I would say because it is so much easier because you get a cult following or a group following okay. and it grows. It's organic and organic growth is respected today. Wow. And I would say, and that's just organic. kind of my, my thought. Oh. <laughs> exactly, it's organic and gluten-free. <laughs> but, um, but, I mean, you think about this when it comes to videos. Um, you guys have Facebook accounts or Instagram, but if you go live on anything, you were live just a little while ago, George, on yeah. Facebook. <clears throat> it used to be, if you were going to be creating a video, you wanted to have professional lighting, professional camera people, 
and and really have a professional quality but that's actually looked down on now because it looks fake huh yeah this is this is something really? that's good yeah i know it's interesting and so the so that same process is when it comes to self-publishing so publishing a book by yourself does not automatically mean it's not going to be successful this is one way to get your foot in the door. Make a name for yourself, and you have that possibility by self-publishing. If you self-publish and you start with something that you're like, this is something I can be known for, and you start making a name for yourself, it, it is get your foot in the door in those publishing houses, because again, they're looking for a proven author and speaker. And, and so this is why, if you want to go you know, one route or the other, there's not one right way to do it. But self-publishing is not a is not a mistake in and of itself, and also just getting it published anywhere that can be a mistake. Getting it published in a in a professional publisher that does not have a good reputation could actually be more harmful. So you want to kind of weigh these out again, pray about it, but see what it is that you're that you're comfortable with. You get to make a name for yourself when it comes to self-publishing. Did I see a question pop up there? No, they're just they're, they're chatting. Okay. Yeah. Is there a question so far? So, so I covered these very in a shallow way, but I want to just kind of put those out. When th these are your options, pretty much. Self-publishing, professional publishing. Professional publishing is a marathon because it really is looking for that place, getting it through, possibly getting it, possibly not. But publishing and self-publishing, you can do automatically, but then you're the person who's doing all of the marketing, and we'll get to marketing in just a bit. Right. So all of that stuff that the, the publishing house would do, you have to do on your own. But it doesn't mean it cannot be done. So James wants to know, what are some of the good publishers oh, goodness. that you it like? Depends, it really depends on the topic that you're going for. So for Christian, I know Destiny Image is one of the, like, the, the big names that are out there. Um, it depends on the topic because everybody, all the different publishers have their, have their niche or what they're known for. Um, so, so that was difficult to, to answer. Destiny Image is the one that I know that's just sprung to the top of my mind when it comes to Christian publishers. And, and um, some of those professionals will take up to 40, 50, 60 percent. Oh yes, that's true. I didn't think about that. Yeah. But it depends upon, and, and then you only get a small royalty, so you never make a lot of money. That's true. So that, and, and you can weigh that out too when it comes to, when it comes to publishing. They've got the bigger platform, but they also take the bigger cuts. Right. Are you familiar with Zulan Press? Several people we know have published or, or working with them to publish books. Zoolander? What? Zulan Not Press. Not Zoolander. No, no, no. <laughs> Zulan Press. Is this, Press. A, book? Is this a, a library for ants? No. <laughs> they do a lot of books. Well, they do. I, I'm not familiar. When it comes to publishing houses, that's not something I'm well versed in because most of the people I work with, they chose to either self publish or they're working with other individuals. So. And, and how many have you done that end up on Amazon and Kindle? Oh yeah, Amazon's easy. You can do that um, with anything. So we'll get to Amazon in just a second. But Am uh, yeah, Amazon, no matter what you do, get your book on Amazon. Who does Lisi use? Lucy's, uh, Lisi's done several books. <laughs> and poems. And poems. Did you, uh, just which, who, who did your publishing? The poems are just on a blog. Oh, the poems the Amazon on was the create space. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I did that. And so that's self publish. Right. Self -published. Yeah. So you, and uh, uh, so Lisi's saying, I don't know if you can hear, but she's self published. And so, and, and what happens is, if, uh, and Amazon's amazing. And that's why this self publishing is, is such an easier market than it used to be, or publishing is. Because when you self publish, you put it on Amazon. And suddenly it's available for people in New Zealand and, and Australia and Africa. Like anybody can go and find it, you know. It depends on, like Kindle is definitely available everywhere. Maybe not China, I don't know. But, uh, um, but when it comes to the, and, uh, and we'll get Cliff to answer some questions about the, the Kindle Direct Publishing, which they're doing now. Um, but they, uh, well, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself because I'm all excited. I, let, I like the self-publishing because there's so much more I think you can do. Um, a professional publisher will also read your work and they may tell you what to put in your book and what not to put in your book. So they will take some of the creative license away depending on, on why, what they believe or not. That's why Rick started the publishing house he did was because nobody would publish his book or they wanted him to change too much of it. You know, and so that whole concept that that's today he would have just been like, I'm putting it on Amazon. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm going to go ahead and KDP that. So 
physical copies versus digital copies. So if you go with a if you go with a publishing house, that whole thing is they they take care of everything. You don't have to worry about it. So now I'm talking about self publishing. Do I want to have physical copies of my book or do I want to just have digital? Like I told you, we're going to go through details here. <laughs> These are things, decisions that you will have to make eventually. If you decide to go with publishing house, you don't have to worry about it. This is if you're going with printing things on your own. If you have physical copies, you're going to want, and I'm going into details here, printers. Who's going to print the book? Yeah. Now this one I found just by like looking through some things online. There are companies that do this. They publish your book. They do the layout. They do everything. One of the ones that I found that had the most respected reviews was called Book Baby. Have you heard of that one? Uh, yeah. No. Yeah. Um, but they will do everything. But they are pricey. <laughs> so, but they're going to do the layout. They're going to help you with the design. They're going to help you get the. They're going to do the ISBN, the barcode. You won't have to worry about anything. So, if that's in your price range, that's excellent. Most people are going to go with local printers or custom printers, especially if you're the type of person who's like, you know what, I want to, if you're a hands-on person, because I've worked with a person who's like, I want to do everything. You're going to need a place to store the book. Like, these are all the different things and concepts that come out. Who's going to be doing the shipping and handling if I'm going to be holding the book? You know, most people, I would say, are, should go, could and should go with Amazon because they do print on demand. I know. All right, Lisey, all right, go ahead. Tell us some about, can you, uh, can I turn it over to Lisey and she talk a little bit about it? Or? Yeah, um, basically, we did it through Create Space. Yeah. Uh, which, which is not a It's small with me. But it literally took us two days just to load the whole book mm -hmm. on it. And um, it was available immediately yeah. on, on Kindle mm -hmm. and then they print on demand. So yeah. I can literally now pull up Amazon, go back to Lino Lisa, see the book, order it five, two days. They print it. it it's, it's, a, it's, it's something, it's amazing. Cause, and Amazon started as a publishing, like they were a book company. And yeah. this is what they started off. And so this is why they've done so much when it comes to books. So. It used to be called Create Space. I'll go into the differences and the things that have changed recently. And I think Cliff has something too. Oh, okay. Let me see. I'm going to just go ahead and put oh. some of this stuff up there. Yeah, go ahead and talk about first, and then Cliff, then you can look through. Yeah, so when it comes to Amazon's print on demand, and we're still talking about physical copies. Oh, yeah. What's great about print on demand is you don't have to store anything. What they do is they find a local printer. They've already done the negotiations with them. Somebody orders on Amazon, the order gets sent to the printer. The printer prints the book and sends it to the person. So you don't have to store anything. Now you can't, now the price is higher, which means they take less, you know, you get less yeah. money, they take more. So you can also say, hey, I want to have 50 books. I'm going to a conference or I've got a party or whatever. And you can order and the price goes down the more you order. And uh, um, so you can stockpile books, but then again, if you're wanting to sell it yourself and ship it out, you have to figure kind of all those details out. That's why I like Amazon with its print on demand. Um, so it used to be called Create Space, but it's now called Kindle Direct Publishing. It, was, it went down in, a, a, or I'd say KDP launched in August last year. So it's really new, but it is, um, I would say the exact same, pretty much everybody who's works were on create space they basically just shifted companies over merged it over with kindle um i'm going to talk about digital copies and then when I, I want to hear cliff's experience with kindle with digital copies your three major ones are kindle Nook, and itunes um i would say don't, me personally don't waste your time with itunes i worked with one one um, one client of mine did all three formats i want to do kindle i want to do Nook. i don't want to do itunes and they each have different layouts. And iTunes was the most complicated and had the most steps and hurdles you had to get through to get on there. And that person has not sold one book after the, all of that work wow. on iTunes. It's just not known for people downloading books. Nook, they've sold a handful of copies. By far, I would say 90% have been sold through Kindle. It's just the, it's the biggest platform. And it's one that's got the most books, yes. I want to encourage everybody that now's the time to do your books. I can see all of you getting your books self-published. Mm -hmm. And I just want to share a local story right here in River City uh, from about 15 years ago. A friend of ours who's a, a pretty good author 
well-known person, some of you may know him, but he was on Sid Roth's show. You're going to be on Sid Roth. And Sid, and Sid Roth said, this book is great. How many have you got on him? He said, oh, a couple hundred. He said, you need 5,000 before you come on the show to talk about this book. So he, he spent lots of money. Uh -huh. He got all these hardback cover books wow. in his garage for the, like the next two or three years. Oh, and God. they sold very few off of the Sid Roth show. Oh, no. So praise God we have the technology and the tools today that you don't have to spend your life savings to get a book out mm -hmm. there and just do it the easy way, the old fashioned way. Yes. Yeah. And so, thank you, Lord, for a digital publishing. And Cliff, do you want to talk about your experience with uh, Kindle Direct Publishing? Sure. Um, thanks. One of, one of the uh, blessings, I, I, I write, but I'm not professional. And I'm, I'm writing and publishing um, what I say without trying to offend people, <laughs> if I have the liberty to say it. Um, theologically oriented uh, books for the biblically illiterate. Um, <laughs> That's a wonderful title. That's I a love huge how market. detailed that audience huge market. That's wonderful, though. I, I like how detailed that audience. Yeah, can, can you say it again, Cliff? Uh, <laughs> theologically oriented books for the uh, biblically illiterate. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good target audience. That's a good target audience. <laughs> and, and what I mean by that, um, you know, it's one thing to, to – uh, you know, my emphasis is trying to write um, from a new wine skin perspective, you know, of unfolding truth. And um, my thesis and, and one of the books was uh, establishing a new wine skin leadership matrix, which I've um, been involved in for a long time. And, and um, but as far as the, the publishing thing with KDP, you know, self-taught, you know, uh, mm -hmm. it, there's a lot of legwork to do. There's a lot of study to do. You have to get on there. Um, their website and, and you just, you, you download, you choose and you download the format for your book. And so they have all these formats of different sizes and everything. And several, I, I think I've done three so far where um, I took my topic of the, of the book and did that in six by nine, which is the most common that people use in bookstores, particularly Christian type stuff. And, um, but I also did an eight, eight and a half by 11 study guide. Cause that's what I'm doing is, you know, so that, and they have those different size formats. And so you can put those together. They have as part of the, um, uh, what, what would you say? The, uh, what's available there on Amazon KDP, they have, uh, templates for your cover as well to design the cover. And so you can do, um, they have photos, they have multiple covers that you choose from. They have a limited selection of being able to choose or change fonts in their example. You can choose from a number of fonts, colors that are coordinated, that go together. You know, they, it follows a certain theme. So it really is wonderful from that perspective. Again, you have to put in the hours online. They do have some teaching videos that take you through the basics, but the way to do it is dive in, get your basics and get started. Um, they, when you upload, when you submit an uploaded, whether it's your cover or whether it's the content, um, they have machines that check it, your, and you upload it, but it's all mechanical and it reads it and it, it, it will send it back. Okay. You've got 15 errors and it shows you where they are on their digital response of your book. You can turn it page by page. And so then you see the errors and all that kind of stuff. It can be very frustrating. And again, I'm not an expert, but again, I didn't have the money to pay a professional company or if they would take it to do it. And so one of the frustrating issues for me, as you're getting, you think you're about ready and you submit your whole thing, um, if you have one mistake that needs to be changed and you go in there and you change it, it may shift. If it shifts a line or two lines, everything after that, if you're in the first chapter, everything after it, it shifts the whole book, those, that amount of spaces. Oh, right. so, so everything gets out of alignment. And then you have to get, go back through and re 
you know, delete the, the extra lines in there and readjust it, resubmit it, and go. Th I've gone through the process probably 15 times of resubmitting my copy to the machine to where it finally was accepted. And then I ordered, you can order an author copy to preview. Yeah. And so they'll send that to you. And, yeah. you know, it's very inexpensive. You yeah. Order your own author copy, which is a, um, a proof copy. And it's got proof written across it, so you can't sell it, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and then, you, then you look at the physical book page by page and you see oh that's not it right that's not right that's not right you make the adjustment and resubmit it you order a new proof copy go through the whole process and i just helped a friend of mine get his done and uh, it was quite a work but i, I love the guy he's a great guy and, and helped him get it done and he just had it put it in the uh, morning star bookstore um so most uh, from what i can tell most of the books at morning star bookstore have been published through that. That's what they look like. I recognize some of the pre-formatted covers and designs and that kind of stuff. But it's a very, very, uh, I think, effective way. One other thing, as a as traveling minister, uh, and I'm mostly overseas, but let's say um, you were asked to go to a conference and speak on your theme, okay? You can have those books shipped to your conference ahead of time. You don't, one, you don't have a, a, a garage full of books because like, um, you know, she was saying in the past, you had to order a minimum amount of copies, 5,000 books, you know, or something like sitting in your, in your garage until you could sell enough to recoup your money. They will, you can order the exact amount. You can have them shipped to the address at the church or the conference you're going to and have them there before you get there. So you don't have to even transport you. So there's a lot of benefits to it. Again, you can do it as you upload it. You can do a print version and you can do an ebook version. It's all on there. Okay. And so you have multiple things. And then they also have agreements with many other, um, what well, sellers, resellers around the world. And so they have a, a price, um, percentage, uh, however you say outline on it for the different companies. You know, and so you can choose Barnes and Noble, Kindle, all these things right on the Amazon. Okay. And then they'll, they'll transfer the currency. You can set the currency differences. They do that. And so like I, I like I said, I just got my first um, digital download from Japan, you know, didn't make much money on it, but it, that's not what it's about. It's about getting the truth for us as far as ministers, we're getting truth that God has put in our lives that we've paid a price to to apply and get hold of and share it with the body of Christ among the nations. Now, what may happen as a missionary, you know, God, that person that ordered it in Japan may be the person that opens the door. If they, if God wants them to, for me to go there and minister on that topic of how to establish new wineskin leadership churches um, in that nation. So, you know, if you're, if it's a, and I know the people on this, uh, feed, whatever, you know, with CMM, it's all about building the body of Christ and ministering the gospel to people among the nations and whatever genre you're called to and theme. But it's a tremendous tool. You just have to labor through it. And then, you know, I did have somebody pay to have my first book edited, you know, somebody uh, that believed in who I was and the content that I had. That was a tremendous blessing. Um, but I have gone the route of sharing my, um, my copy that I had, had printed out myself, uh, with friends and say, Hey, would you read through this? You know, take a pen, mark anything you see that I missed any input, that kind of stuff. And so, um, I, it's just, it's incredible what's available, but that's all I'll, you know, I'll be quite after from this point. Thank you for sharing all that because it really is. It's, it's amazing how much is done for you because for yes. me that was such a huge relief especially with um amazon and kindle because uh the kindle formatting um like cook said they've got their format but there's videos on how to do it like i've done I, it's so helpful um i've done it i know friends who've done it and, and like cliff said you don't have to be a professional you right. just know know how to use a word document you know which right you type in a computer you know how to do it so it's, it's little details 
but it got it's built in user friendly like Coach said they'll send it back to you definitely always get that author's proof copy uh, because and this is something that 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 we you know that that I've done before with a person that I was working with got the proof copy started flipping through and realized that the font changed size from 12 point font to 11 point font for mm -hmm. one of the chapters and one of the chapters only and you don't see that when it's on the screen like it's something that you're just kind of going through and looking but when we printed it had the physical copy we realized oh no it changed yes. the thing but it's just or or like Cliff said the layout didn't look what, right or the, the the things just aren't on there so it's it's order it go through it page by page look at it make sure it looks like it on the page like you want and um and and then uh because Amazon is using whoever the local printer is, whoever the closest person is to where it's being delivered to. That's how that. That's how they do it. It will be slightly different from one place to another. Mm -hmm. So you make sure that if you if you order spot copies, you know that, that you're like, all right, you know, is it doesn't have any errors in it. And uh, and like Cliff said as well, if you're going to speak somewhere, you can order it, have it shipped there. They actually print it locally wherever it is that you're going and ship it locally. So. It depends on what country you're going into, but some countries you can order it and have it printed in that country. And so you're not having to order books here and ship them. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, Sarah, um, yeah. I did want to say that um, I just finished a, um, a KDP. Yes. Uh, for Kindle. I just did the Kindle mm -hmm. for someone. And um, I've got to add the pictures to it. But what I did was I stripped it from, from the, um, I made it into a plain text first. Yeah. And then, I put it into the free flow template. I chose the free flow. Nice. Free flow template. Then anytime I make a change, I don't have to keep going back and doing whatever. It just kept adding to. Mm -hmm. I can't control the layout, but you know what? I figured every device is different, and mm -hmm. so it's going to free flow anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I let it be a total free flow. Mm -hmm. um, what you're talking about is having words, just making sure your words are in the right section mm -hmm. with the right titles. And then I stripped, like I stripped it from the um, the code because Microsoft Word um, will also add code to it, and so I always put it in plain text first, mm -hmm. and then I went ahead and, and put it in that. And, and they do that because, like you said, every device is different. And the way that Kindle works is it makes it to where if somebody zooms in on something, right. all of the words, like it changes the page size. Mm -hmm. If you guys have ever read something in Kindle, all of a sudden it'll say 200 mm -hmm. pages as opposed to 50 pages, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it'll change that. So that's what the formatting does. But but they give you a choice now mm -hmm. in the Kindle. They give you a choice of a template with a size. Mm -hmm. Then you've got to keep going back and changing stuff or a free flow. Mm -hmm. I, I chose the free flow first off because I understood that, you know, that's yeah, they're like, going to stretch. And free flow is better. I didn't realize those were the differences yeah. because people, it's, um, and, and people are used to that. They'll pinch zoom on anything, you know, and just be like, I want to make the writing big enough for me to see. Or you have iPad, laptop, and fonts. Yeah, and that's if you're going with digital. Right, so if you're right. if you're trying to go to now KDP is different because it's the direct publishing. So that's oh, the direct, right. yeah. So it's I'm, different. It's the Kindle. Yeah, Kindle is just for the digital. Right. If you're doing direct publishing, that means that you're wanting a physical copy. Physical, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but yeah, the uh, um, so you've got you've got options. Yeah. You've got so many options. Am I overwhelming you with yeah. options? I knew I would. Um, all right, so I want to go to the uh, um, nitty gritty details here of copywriting, ISBN codes, and barcodes. Oh my! There's, again, this is if you're wanting to do every single thing. Now, Kindle and Amazon, um, let me ask uh, Cliff, this is just a quick question. Do they, did they supply the barcodes and ISBNs for you? They will, or you can purchase your own. All right, good. Um, uh, it was as I was reading through kind of like the new processes. Um, the recommendations I kept seeing was get your own barcodes so that you own them, and they're not just the barcodes that are that are included. You can get them cheaper, and uh, um, and so I'm going to just go over that. First one is copywriting necessary. You, yeah. It's, yeah. Look, it George is all like, I know the answer to that one. <laughs> yes, it is. Um. You go, uh, copywriting is easy. It's $35 a book. You go to EC, ecocopyright.gov. And this is if somebody decides to take your book or idea and start presenting it as your own, this is how you protect it. Uh, it's something that's, uh, especially in this modern age where people will use other people's words or you know that type of thing, if you want to protect it, especially if it's going to be something that you are wanting to make a name around or make a ministry around or make some kind of, this is, 
Um, you want to copyright it. It's easy. I, I, I've done a copywriting before, and, and it literally takes five minutes. Like it's not that it's not that big of a deal. But when I've been working with, with writers, that's one of the first questions they'll ask because it seems like such a, it's, and it's, it's an unknown. You know, how many hurdles do I have to jump through in order to get it copyrighted? It's just one. You literally just submit it and then pay the money. ISBNs, which stands for International Standard Book Number, in case you ever wanted to know. Um, is it necessary? If you're trying to sell your book online or in a bookstore, it is. If you're just trying to buy, you know, if you're trying to make a book and print it and keep it at your house or hand it out to friends, you don't have to have it. But I, I had a, a friend of mine who they brought me like 10 or 20 of their favorite Christian books that were little small booklet sizes. All of them had barcodes but one. One of them, they said, oh, I just picked it up, the person at a table at a fair, at a book fair, and, they, I, and I just kind of picked one up, they were for sale, but did not have a barcode on it. But it's so rare, I would say, get the barcodes, um, get the ISBNs. Um, you do have to have one for each style of book. So it's a barcode, it's an ISBN for your physical book, for your Kindle, and if you go with a Kindle and a Nook and an iTunes book, they're different for each one. That's why I'm saying just go with Kindle. Um, Deidre's asking, mm -hmm. is this copyright only for USA or is it international? Oh, that is such a good question. Um, it's something that's, it's, that's such a good question. I don't know if I know that off the top of my head because I've only worked with American authors. I should know this. It is. It should be international, right? Yeah, at least he's saying it is. Yeah, it is international. Um, so it's something that establishes it um, based off of the, uh, it's a government website, and so it's established by the American government, but that's respected, I believe, internationally. It's something that if somebody takes your book and starts working in a different country and using it, you can, you can I don't know how you pursue that type of thing, but it's, it sets parameters around your work and say, this is when I published it, and I've got the right, I've copyrighted it. So for the ISBNs, you have to buy them in bundles. And I do recommend, especially if you're going to be publishing and you know you're going to do more than one, go ahead and get 10. If you know you're going to be doing um, more, you know, five or six books, get 100 of them. Um, a lot of um, book cover designers, they will have bought them. So you could possibly purchase one there. But this is, again, the little things that you want to check with. When you're working with somebody who does the layout for your book, or if you're working with KDP and you're working with Kindle, or you're working for a book designer, ask them, are they gonna provide an ISBN or do I need to bring my own? But you wanna make sure you check that box. Now ISBNs and barcodes, that's how you get your barcodes. Are barcodes necessary? It's the same thing. If you wanna sell it in a bookstore or on Amazon, you have to have one. And like I was saying, book cover designers frequently um, create them as part of their services. Um, I've worked with just uh, three um, book cover designers. All of them provided barcode. They're, they're like, give me your ISBN, I'll create your barcode. And, uh, and so in one of them, I had to supply the ISBN. Another one, they had purchased a bunch of ISBNs and they included it in their purchase price. So when they gave me their itemized list, they're like, here's the design, here's the price of the ISBN, barcode was free, you know, like, and they'll, they'll itemize it out for you. But barcode, barcodesinc.com generator is a free service. Yeah. Oh. I told so you there's so many details. Yeah. The I, difference between the ISBN and the barcode? ISBN is the number. So, and the barcode is just the thing that, like, the lines and the scans. So, so when you pay for your ISBN number, yes. you don't get the barcode with it. It has to be generated somewhere. Correct. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Right. So, okay. So I just pulled this book right. off the shelf. So for those that are kind of, you can't see it. Um, but the ISBN number, and you'll want to go with, um, uh, you know, like whatever your, the, the standard is, but you purchase the ISBN number, and it's always listed across the top. And barcode generator, this one's free. You just type in your ISBN number, and it'll generate a barcode. Um, I don't know why it's not, why they don't charge anything, but they don't. So there would probably be an app for it. Yeah, there's an app for it. Exactly. Just like if you guys have uh, ever generated a QR code, those yeah. things are free. Yeah. You, yeah. Can, you can generate those for days. So, so Deidre's answered her own question. She said that she gets hers from the Australian government. No. So I, I asked her, I said, what made you mention? She said she's only done it once. Uh-huh. And she wondered if there's a different one. I don't know. I, 
that's such a good question. Um, and uh, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna actually do some talk, do some research and look look that up. But I would say register or copyright your book in whatever country it is that you're publishing it in. Uh, and so because even if you're selling it in an international market, you're you're publishing it here, but selling it in Singapore, it's copyrighted in America or it's copyrighted in Australia. And I believe that there's that um, what's it called mutual agreement between governments. And so. It will really depend. There's some governments I think that are loose, looser on copyright laws. But you'll, when it comes to copyright, this is what I explained to one author. It really depends on copyright your book. That's important. But am I going to pursue a person if they quote from my book and try and take credit for it? Like that's the decision that you have to make if that happens. Yeah. You know, China they have a, a unique copyright system there. They copy your book, right? <laughs> Exactly. That's what I was thinking. I was like, it really, it really depends. And for some people, they will, um, it really is their life with it. They're, they, you know, this is their book. It's, they're making it into their movie and this is how they're producing, you know, and, and so they will pursue um, if somebody violates their, their copyright. But for some people, it's not important. You know, they're like, ah, you know, it doesn't, however it gets out, it doesn't matter type thing. But I like, I think you copyright a book so partly, mainly because you've got, it'll have your name attached to it and it's officially yours. For me, it's almost like putting the bookend on something. I have copyrighted it. I'm mm -hmm. done with it. And um, so, and it's only $35. So, Sarah? Yes, please. Uh, what I have is also a little QR reader code mm -hmm. at the back of the book. So if you have a blog or a website, oh, that's so that good! Can just scan that little blog as well. Yeah. Just work that into your artwork at oh. the back of your book. You, you have given me a wonderful transition. So when it comes to marketing and promoting your book, Lisi, and this is such a great, great idea. Um, you can create a QR code. QR code is the thing that looks like the little box of squiggles. I don't have an example of one, but, um, but. A QR code can be scanned by any phone or device that scans a barcode, and it can be directed to go to any website. It can also pull up if uh, I had somebody who made a, a who they made just a sentence out of out of a QR code mm -hmm. um, where it would type it. I, I, I'll go into details, but you can do so much with QR mm -hmm. codes. So when it comes to marketing and promoting your book, if you've got a blog, or if you've got a website, if you've got a landing page, or anything that you're like, this is helpful. Put it in the put a QR code in the back of your book. It's it makes it interactive so that you're not just throwing a book out into the universe and expecting not to talk about it or not to have engagement with your audience. You want to think, how is my audience going to find me? How am I going to talk to them? What relationship are we going to have with each other? But I, I've noticed there are a lot of people now who don't have those QR code readers on their phones, and it's hard to get them to do that. Mm -hmm. At least a certain generation. I don't see the young people doing it. And the older people don't do it. It's like the middle group does, but mm -hmm. I can't get the older young to do that. Have, um, you, have you noticed that? I would say that if you want to, you know, find out who your audience is. Yeah. And that goes back to go into whatever books you've published in the past five to ten years and, yeah. and see. But that's true. Um, the QR codes, I've seen them recently in, a, um, in print where a person was handing out flyers and they were wanting the people to go to their website and they were trying to get them an easy way to go to their website without having to type it in. Right, but I mean that's good. It really, it really depends on what uh, it works. If you've got a handout like a paper flyer, mm -hmm. but if you're sending somebody an email, then just embed that thing in there. But if you've got a book, mm -hmm. a physical book, QR code, send them to your website, send them to your Facebook, send them to your landing page, whatever it is that you're working on. Karen. I just want to go back to copyright for a second. I've been thinking about copywriting my dissertation. Mm -hmm. Is that an okay thing to do? Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Especially because it's some you can copyright yeah. anything. Um, and, 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 and so if it's something that you want to do, um, yeah, copyright your dissertation. There's no there's no reason oh, not to. Oh yeah, we do that. Yeah, there's no reason not to. Yeah. Um it's for for me, like I said, I like doing it because it's not like I have I finished this and I want to say I want to have my name attached, attached to it and have it on, on official record that this was something that I did. For me, it's almost like, again, like that seal of being finished, seal of approval. 
And with that, I just want to say something. As I am researching for my dissertation, I have come across at least one, maybe a couple books that really look like they were somebody's dissertation <laughs> and, and they got them out there and I happened to purchase it because the title caught my eye and I read, yeah. you know, enough and looked through it and, and, and bought it, but it's written like it's really close to probably what their dissertation was and they might have just made a few changes um, not a lot you know and and so i think for some people who want to publish for academia oh, yeah. it's not unheard of to take your dissertation make just some minor changes and that could also be a book but it's going to have that narrow audience of, of academia more yeah exactly because and, and you and you can do that there's definitely books that i use for mine when i was doing my research for my degree where i was like all right this is somebody else's dissertation but i agree with their, what their statement was where they had approach that were coming alongside mine and i wanted to use yours and and so it goes to who do, who do you want your audience to be so i would say if you want to publish your dissertation do so and then if you want to try and say, I want to keep pursuing this topic and see if I can find a different audience. So this would be the path to do that. And that's why, go ahead and get a bunch of ISBNs because you're going to have you know, books for days on those. But, goodness. But there's not, there's not one way to do it. I'm giving you so many options and so many details. And like I said, I knew it was going to be overwhelming with details. But um, idea is you figure out what works best for you, what audience you, it is you want to have, and the, and, the, and the kind of impact you want. Like if you're wanting to impact the academic audience, that's the way to do it. I want to go on any other questions when it comes to the printing and publishing. This is the, I, I would say I get asked these questions every time I work with somebody that's writing because it's there's just so much unknown about it. Mm. And so I like having these details out there. I wanted to show you it's not as difficult as it seems. There really is a lot of ready-made stuff out there. Mm. And then I want to just briefly touch on marketing and promotions. Marketing and promotions is all about what is most comfortable to you. Um, if you are the person who likes to write a whole lot and type up a bunch of things and you're going to want to get on Facebook or blog, and have that kind of kind of thing put out there. If you're the type of person who likes to take really interesting pictures and exploring pictures and you know like uh, uh, beautiful things, then you're gonna your target audience is gonna be on Instagram. What is it that your audience is doing that's gonna tell you how best to market? Um, how many of you guys know that Facebook is kind of phasing out? Like the younger mm -hmm. audience is not even on Facebook. I was so amazed at that. I was like, well, I, I know. Instagram. When I know they're on Instagram. When I was in, in college, it, the big thing was you could not get a Facebook unless you were in college. And so it had this whole like, ooh, I've got a Facebook. Mm -hmm. It had this prestige with it. And it was the cool, it was the cool crowd. That's mm -hmm. what I tell my nephew. Um, my nephew is 13 and does not have a Facebook. But uh, I know. But um when we were in school, they used the abacus. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I remember. They did the paper clip. They showed us. Before that. my time, George. <laughs> they did a little thing that they did a little thing to go. I know you're not that. That's <laughs> before my time, George. <laughs> But I couldn't believe that when uh, um, I was uh, I, I was talking to the um, uh, these students in college, and they're like, we don't have a Facebook, and so they are all on Instagram. And so if your audience is the younger generation, creating a Facebook page for your book is not going to be helpful. But having an Instagram account and talking about it through that through that method and through that platform would be helpful. Now I have not, I've done a little bit with Instagram, but that is not my forte. That's not going to be something that I drift into. And so when I am going to be marketing my book, whatever platform is popular, I am going to have to hire somebody. I already know that about myself. I'm like, nope, I'm going to stick on the Facebooks. And depending on what my audience is, but who is your audience? What is it that they are doing? What are they, where, what are they hanging out digitally, socially, physically? Where are they? Think about book signings. When it comes to getting your book out there, are, is your audience going to go to a book signing? Where would your audience be at a certain time of day? What time would they be there? Where would they be? What time would they be there? Think about that. 
So I've got a, a, a friend of mine who he saw, he set up book signings at Christian bookstores, but he had to really think about what time to be there because his audience was a college audience. So he could honestly be there at any time as long as it wasn't seven or eight in the morning because his audience is not going to be at the bookstore at that time. But in the afternoon, it's fine, or even middle of the day, it's fine. It's casual, you know. But if your book signing is targeted to mothers or parents, do not set it up for after three o'clock on a weekday because those people are picking up their kids at school. They are not going to go to your book signing. Does that make sense? So think about who your audience is, where they're going to be, what are they going to be doing, and how are they going to be hanging out. When it comes to social media, I'm just going to touch this one briefly because it changes so much. Marketing and algorithms. If you have done anything on Facebook, you've heard the word algorithm. Um, it changes frequently, monthly even. And so there are some people who that is their only job. I've got a friend of mine, that's her job. She works at a campus and she works on social media and marketing. And so she does research on what is working, what is the algorithm generating now. And so for some of you, you're gonna wanna dive down deep that's going to be who you are, and you are going to want to learn the algorithm. If that's what you want to do, then pursue that, because there are that there is a way to learn that. But if that's not you, you don't have to learn that. Mm -hmm. You find somebody who you can either hire or work with you or be affiliated with you, and and do that part. This is what I like about the book process, the book generating process is you don't have to be the professional at all levels. Now, I've touched on it because I have friends and people who've worked in books and people who I've worked with, and they wanted to know more about this. And so I've been able to kind of touch here and there on some of these topics. But um, become well-versed or hire someone. Those are my two options. Those are your two options. Decide how to do it yourself or find someone who will. And then have some kind of web presence or digital presence, because if not, you're only marketing to people who are in your physical sphere of influence. So you want to be able to, like Cliff was saying, find that one person in Japan, you know, That's multiple right. people in Japan, Cliff, and, uh, and the different people who are not going to see you physically. Because again, the written word is so powerful because mm -hmm. you don't have to be there to make an impact. That's why I love the written word. You can have your voice be present when you aren't. It's so good. Mm -hmm. And this is why the web is so great. And I love this day and age that we live in. So, oh yeah, Karen, go ahead, because I'm waxing. Well, <laughs> today, I was, as I was researching, I wanted to find out about this one, I, I was looking at a commentary and I'd not heard of the guy and his name was kind of unusual. Mm -hmm. Peter Pett was his name. And so I, I thought, um, well, who is this guy? And when I looked it up, I thought he's still living. I think he's living in the UK or something like that. But it looks to me like he donated, he wrote um, commentaries on most books and it said that he's not finished with such and such a other, you know, like Psalms and stuff. He's not mm -hmm. quite finished with them, so they're not there. But it looks like he donated it for free to studylight.org to get it out there. Yeah. He wanted to get the information out there. And so the, I think there are like Bible Hub, Study Light, and some other ones that, um, and, and some of these like CCEL and stuff. Mm -hmm. If you're not necessarily so concerned about selling your book, but you can get it on digitally, you can donate it and oh, it's yes. out there as people are looking and especially CCCL, CCEL is it? Um, a lot of students and a lot of people are searching through those titles mm -hmm. looking for stuff for their thesis and dissertations and things mm -hmm. like that. So you might be able to make a contribution in that way. No, that's really yeah. good. And, and that's what I, I love, again, this day and age, you can get your thoughts out there and, and really just say, all right, you know, be led by the Holy Spirit. See what's available. You know, where is it that you want me to put out my book? Am I supposed to be at book signings? Or do I need to just make this a digital book and just release it out there? And just kind of see, see what happens. Um, what I like is um, we're not in charge of the reaction to what we release in the world. We're just in charge of releasing it in the way that the Lord's asked us to. Amen. It's just about obedience. That's Amen. Great. That's really good. So, um, so I like that. If it's something that you release, you release it in obedience, you pursue the Lord in it, then, That's good. yeah, the Lord brings the increase. So when it comes to web presence, Google your name, and if that doesn't go to a website, go buy that URL. <laughs> 
sarahgodwin.com is already taken. It doesn't go to me. <laughs> Sarah C. Godwin, I did buy. All right. I know. It doesn't go to a website yet, but I went and bought it because I'm like, hey, Sarah. that's my name, and I want to buy that URL. There you go. Um, and so I wanted to make sure. And so go and see if you can buy yours or the name and or the name of your book. Go mm -hmm. ahead. And if you haven't already, buy the name of your URL um, and your book title. So if you're like, I want to have, or the topic of your book title, you know, think about if I were to type this in somewhere, what names would pop up? And you've got so many options, I think, um, when, it, when it comes to, to, to purchasing them. I won't name the, the names of ones you can use, but what's great is you go to any URL purchasing place and um, type in the name. They'll tell you if it's taken or not. If it's taken, they'll tell you ones that are close to what you want. And you can say, all right, these are available. Because again, their their job is to sell you a URL. So, so I would say buy one. Um, consider creating, and I'm just going to go over this one quickly, just because um, these are just basic. I don't want to go into details because marketing will change between now and maybe we leave this room. Right. But, but having your name as a URL is is prob. I would say I'm going to say this probably, but it's more than likely going to be a constant because the internet seems to be here to stay. Um, consider making a landing page. I just put four different platforms up here. I know, Nancy, you're really good at WordPress. So I've got WordPress up there, but make a page that is just about your book. Even if it just points to Amazon and says, buy it here, you don't have to sell it. But have something that says, this is about me, this is about the author, this is about, and you can promote anything you want. You can promote CMM. You can say, yeah, this is idea. what, <laughs> George is like, yeah, we're about CMM. <laughs> um, but, but what it does is it says, I'm connected to these people. This is what I believe in. And it helps whatever platform it is that you're wanting to make. Um, it helps people find you. And it'll be, it's fascinating to me, the stories that I hear about how, oh, I found somebody because I Googled this and they were connected to that and it led me to this. There's just, it's, it's creating places out in the web universe for you to be found. And, um, and so I've got up here, and, and, and you can hire just about anybody to make a website on these. I have personally used Wix recently to create a website. It's the easiest thing. I, I really like it. Um, ClickFunnels is really easy and user-friendly. Squarespace, one of my friends who's an artist, she made her own website. She said it was really easy. WordPress is really sophisticated. It's, it's like the hard. upper level. It's hard. Joomla, too. It's getting hard. Um, there is another one, a free one. I'm gonna oh, yeah. Find uh, a free one for you here. I've got somebody who I'm asking what the, what they did, but um, but is good. My my question for you is: Do do this next generation? Do the next generation? Do they even get in web pages? Uh, you want to make sure whatever it is that you use, you want to make sure it's mobile friendly, that it's mobile optimized, mm -hmm. because every single person, if they don't have it on their computer, they need to be able to get it on their phone. Do they use computers? So mm -hmm. That's my question. Yeah, not a whole lot. And that's why you want to make sure that where, where, whichever one you use has a mobile optimization option. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, um, and, and again, it depends on ask if, if your audience is the next generation, that's a great question to ask, you know. But if your audience are, is your peers, what is it that you use? That's what they're going to be using. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. They aren't so, reading books on their phones, are they? Who is? The, the, the young people today, no, they've are they got reading books books. on their They've got audio books, yeah, but they're and, not and, actually and reading can, books on their phones. Yeah, and audio books is another thing you can <laughs> hire somebody for. It's, it's something that's not... Like there's there's all kinds of different people who that's their that's their profession. George, was that a question I saw? Um, a comment. Um, years ago, um, in mainly for business purposes, but this could apply to this class here also, is you can create articles from your thesis and put them in article forums, and then pay somebody in India or the Philippines. Like I have a girl in the Philippines that works for me for three dollars an hour, and she'll do whatever I give her. She's really IT um, knowledgeable, and and then what's important is in your articles on blogs, you can hire uh, overseas workers to research your, your category that you want your, your audience to be in, to mm -hmm. read that, that audience uh, focused blog or forum service. And the key is to have your signature line uniform. Mm -hmm. So you could put uh, George Parrott, uh, www.cmm.world, Make that the same in, at the uh, SIG page, what they call the SIG line, mm -hmm. of each of your articles, and it'll drive traffic to your website. 
And so I've done that many times and ended up number one in Google, like for a hundred spaces and things like that. And nice. help people market real estate by creating these um, targeted things that will get you number one Google ranking. So you can mm -hmm. also Google how to get number one Google ranking and looking for tips of how to expand your audience. Yeah, all, all of that, like, like when it comes to um, really diving in, figure out which step it is that you're at and then become as much of an expert as you have to, have to be on that level. Um, and, and what's great is you don't have to hire the professionals. You really can just Google how to mm -hmm. and see and, and at least in a cursory level. That's how I do. That's how I fix stuff around my house. Yeah. You know, how do I fix this noise that's going on in my bathroom? Or, you know, what is it? That, how do I fix the stove this way? And I, and, and if it's something that is on a basic level and introductory level which a lot of this is because it's on the surface you can learn how to do it squarespace was the one that um you it for a nominal fee very mm -hmm. small but it's really user friendly mm -hmm. and it looks very professional like you had somebody very well you know oh yeah did, 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 did. i did one in wix and uh, uh and, and they've got a, a free they do have it a, a, a free level um, but as soon as you start you know, putting any kind of blog or any type of membership thing or whatever, then it does increase, like you have to pay for, for something. But it's not a whole lot. Wix and Squarespace, I went back and forth on those two, which ones to use, you know, because they, they were very similar. Very good stuff. But that's when, if you're at that stage where you're like, I have a book, I want to promote it, I want to make a website, check out one of these things and, 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 and see what you, what you want to create. The, the one thing that I, uh, that if you go to any website that's promoting anything, You'll notice something pops up and it asks you to put in your email so you can get a free thing. You're going to want to do that because it, you see it everywhere because it works. Mm -hmm. This is how you get a person's uh, contact information for future promotions. So you can keep them in the loop of what you're doing. And again, this is if you're at that stage. I'm, I know I'm throwing so much information, but give away the first chapter of your book. Or give away an article that you're like, hey, this is close to what I'm talking about. Or this is similar to my book. Yeah. But this is so you can get email captures so that you've got a base market. You are, again, if you're not going with a publisher who's already got all those emails, you've just got the people who are interested in what you're writing. And so this is just a basic marketing thing. Again, you see it everywhere because it works. Mm -hmm. And this is how you build a bit, a bit of a platform. Final thoughts. Mm -hmm because there's been so many. <laughs> this is just a recap. Know your audience, whether you're publishing your dissertation because you wanna reach the academic audience and you wanna be that person who helps reach people at that level. Or you're like, I need to reach people who are in the marketplace. I wanna reach people who are in the business mountain. I wanna reach people who are traveling international. Figure out who your audience is. Get it as detailed. I like clips. People who are theologically minded, but biblically, what was it, Cliff? It was something like biblically mm -hmm. illiterate. Um, that says that they've got a heart for theology. They want to know more about God, but they don't have like that depth of the Bible. And that that, that is such a close, I love the definition of that audience. So figure it out. I want to work with people who are, um, uh, they're just starting their ministry, and I want them to be encouraged in this way, and I want them to have this, I want to help them to get to the next step. Um, so know who your audience is. Do what you can, or what you want to, and hire people or find friends for what you cannot. <laughs> Again, don't feel like you have to do everything, because there are so many steps from the writing, the editing, the printing, and, and publishing, and marketing. There are so many steps. And for some of you, you're going to gravitate towards one or two of those steps and just really hate the rest of them. And you're, the goal is that you don't, you don't have to do everything. The whole thing about we're the body of Christ. We all need each other. It fits in all of these different principles. And like George was saying, there's so many places you can go to to hire people who have that level of professionalism but aren't charging hundreds or thousands of dollars per. Promote yourself in a way that is most you. If you like to talk live on video or you don't mind it, then do live videos. If you can't stand at all being live on video, then do vlogs. You know, if you like talking with people in person, do book signings. If that is not your cup of tea at all, then pre-record. You know, like you've got all these different options for you. But do something that is most comfortable to you and makes sense to you. And the last thing is make step-by-step -step goals because there's so many things that have to be done. 
And I don't want you to feel, you know, leave here being like overwhelmed because there's just so many things. You want to say, am I in the writing process? Am I in the editing process? Am I in the publishing process? Or am I in the promotions process? Those are the different, the basic four steps that we've, that we've gone over. So whatever step it is, make sure that you're not trying to buy barcodes while you're still trying to write your thesis. Does that make sense or your dissertation? Buy that URL tonight, by the way. <laughs> that one is one you do want to do. But other than that, don't worry about anything else. Make sure that you take it step by step. Get those goals that are achievable and finish the dissertation. Shift it towards that book. Figure out what platform it is and what reach it is that you want to have so that your words that you write down can have that effect and can have that lasting effect. And I'll just close with that thought. We're the ones who we sow the seeds, but it's the Lord that brings the increase. That's the verse that came to mind as I was just kind of thinking over this. Mm -hmm. All we're doing is we're doing that due diligence of we're doing the, the tilling, we're doing the planting. But once we sow that seed out there, the seeds of our words out there, it's the Lord that decides what is it that's going to grow. He's the one that decides if it's in season. He's the one that decides that how, how that's going to get, how that's going to break in the ground, what influence it's going to have. So I don't want you guys to feel pressure about that one specifically. All of that's up to the Lord. But what we're doing right now in this season is we are being that diligent servant, that steward of the word, and saying, I'm going to till, I'm going to plant, I want this word to go down deep, listening to the word for the seasons. Are there any questions on all of this? That was so much stuff. It was awesome. It was very good. Great job. It was so good. good. And I hit right at two hours, Nancy. It's perfect. But, um, Perfect. questions because that was so much information so I want to make sure that oh thank you guys for saying, saying thank you. you you guys are so sweet um any detailed questions I can answer later but any uh, if you've got any broad questions let me know I think I hit most of these topics I think some of our internationals um uh are going to need to listen to it a couple times and I get that because you, it was a lot of stuff but, um, but it was really good. Mm -hmm. It was really good. So, anybody have any questions before we um, end the recording? I guess we're good. I'm going to go ahead and.